Good morning. I know people are trickling in after a late night last night, but I don't want to keep you here beyond the. Um, I don't want to keep you here too long this morning, so I'm just going to go ahead and start. There are some handouts which are distributed in various places, so I've, I've left them in heaps and they're coming around. Oh, there's more than one heap. There's more than one heap. <laughs> It seems a uh, it seems kind of a cruel problem to be the last have the last word at the end of this conference, um, especially after so many eloquent people have spoken so eloquently about how stories and poems work. I do not feel very eloquent actually about my own experience as a writer. I don't really even feel very perceptive about it, even after I'm done. When I'm working. I feel like someone has thrown a pillowcase over my head and shoved me into um, a room and locked the door, an unfamiliar room, and locked the door. And I have to blunder around blindly for a very long time, barking my shins and knocking over furniture and falling down until I learn my way around this dark place. My strategy is pure survival mode, desperately circling the room, running my hands over everything until I can walk around without breaking things or killing myself. And even then, I still trip and fall. It can be a painful business sometimes, writing. Thank you for having me here this week. Thank you for all the ways in which this has been an inspiring few days. Thank you to the talented people who shared their work. I feel this weird combination of totally energized and completely exhausted. Maybe you guys feel that weird combination too. In any case, if this was a bar and I was trying to close up, I would be pouring a last round now and then waiting 10 minutes and flashing the lights to get you all out of here. Um, but it's a little early in the morning, probably, for a drink, so I'm not going to do that. No shots. Um, Peter said the other evening that a closing ought to contain a benediction, which, of course, is exactly right. So here's my benediction for you. Keep the faith. Do not give up this difficult endeavor, and when you are in the dark, remember that just because you can't see anyone else doesn't mean that you are alone. There are plenty of friends out there, and I expect you have made some new ones this week. I'm going to read an essay. It's actually part of a much longer essay, and this section in particular is about the problem of trying to write happy moments in fiction. Um, Things ought to be titled. So the title is The Difficult Art of Happiness. And, and I hope it's helpful to you in some way. My young students in creative writing like to cause catastrophes in their stories. And they take aim at their poor characters like wild-eyed assassins. The heart, being worn so frequently on the sleeve, is easily accessible. And usually they go for that first. Next, they go for their characters' friends, lovers, parents, and pets especially dogs and horses. They arrange shootings and beatings. They mutilate their characters in bomb blasts. They have them lied to, cheated on, raped, robbed, pursued by dogs and wolves, paralyzed for life by diving headfirst into shallow water, crippled by addiction, abused by lovers and guardians and parents and school teachers, run over by trains, crushed by falling buildings during earthquakes, and um, bitten by vampires. And in one case, actually recently, um, I had a student write a story about someone who was killed in order for a vampire to enjoy the victim later. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, the best story was one that I got at the very end of this semester in which uh, a girl who has already been um, diagnosed with a terminal illness dies on the story's last page in a car accident. <laughs> on the way to her high school graduation. <laughs> I am not unsympathetic, actually, to the impulse at work here. I think we writers are rather afraid of happiness. When I was in middle school, a teacher asked us to keep a daily journal for a month. The idea, I imagine, was that by asking us to pay attention to our lives, we would become more thoughtful about them. Try to be one of those people on whom nothing is lost, as Henry James recommended. For a few days, I recorded the unremarkable circumstances of my life. I woke up, I went to school, I came home, I ate dinner, 
I watched My Three Sons, or Gilligan's Island, that dates me, or reruns of I Love Lucy on TV. I did my homework. It was very dull. Woe was me. I had no problems. What a wretched circumstance for a writer. After a week, I was deeply bored of this exercise, so I began to make things up. I transformed my parents' contented marriage into a hotbed of argument. I cast myself as the neglected child with oppressive levels of responsibility on her fragile young shoulders. <laughs> I portrayed our home, which was in fact lovingly tended by my mother, who was a good cook and a gardener and a knitter and a seamstress, as a squalid hellhole, the cupboards, of course, bare. I sent my mild-mannered father on long, mysterious business trips to distant and dangerous and surely unbelievable places. I gave him a mistress, a detail that seemed daring to me at the time and of which I was very proud. I believe I described scenes in which I sat on the roof of our house and contemplated throwing myself off. I can't remember now all the lies I told, but they were sufficiently outrageous that after some time my mother was summoned to school and I was summoned to the teacher's office, where the important distinction between truth and fiction was impressed upon me. I had worried people. I was embarrassed. And I was interested. I had discovered something important about storytelling, which is that there must be a problem, a conflict, as we say in creative writing classes, for the story to be interesting. I had bored myself silly with tedious accounts of geometry homework and supper, and here and there in desperation, sentimental and overwritten descriptions of autumn. I had understood that something had to be done to rescue the circumstance. It was fall, September or October, when we had to keep these journals. I remember that it was fall because I remember the coolness of the pane of glass in my bedroom when, alone and restless, contemplating the blank page of my journal, I put my hand to it at night or sometimes my forehead. I remember mist on a pond I passed in the early morning when I walked to the school bus stop, a willow tree overhanging the black surface of the water. I remember the pair of geese who came to the pond. Was it the same pair every year? I wanted to think so. And then one day vanished. I remember the smell of leaves burning. I remember the woman, the cigarette girl, my grandfather called her, who stood in a closet behind a Dutch half door and took the coats and sold cigarettes in the restaurant where my extended family ate meals on Sunday nights when the weather turned cold. Those were the days when they actually sold cigarettes in restaurants. <laughs> God, that dates me too. I wrote about none of this in my journal. I did not write about the glamour of the cigarette girl's black hair piled on her head, the absolute blankness of her expression, the cigarette smoldering in the ashtray on the counter before her. I did not write that I was afraid of her or that after being helped from my coat, by my courtly grandfather, I was glad to be away from her blank gaze, relieved to take my protected place at the table between my older cousins and to receive the Shirley Temple placed before me. Like most adolescents, I was worried all the time in those years in a completely solipsistic way about myself, about how complicated and difficult it was to make and keep a friend, about how impossible it seemed that a boy would ever love me, about whether I had anything to offer the world. I did not write about any of that, either. <laughs> Yet, for all my lies in that awful record of my adolescent existence, all my failures to be the kind of person on whom nothing was lost, I was telling a kind of truth. I knew, because even a happy child knows it in her bones, that the world was full of mystery. The empty face of that cigarette girl that spoke so eloquently of anger and injury, and sometimes a bodily grief. My father, alone in his chair in the living room, a drink in his hand, the night my grandfather died, drowning in the ocean after suffering a heart attack. I knew that one could sit on the roof of one's house at night, as I sometimes did, my arms wrapped around my knees, and see through the trees into the lit windows of other people's houses, where strangers came and went in their strange rooms, conducting their strange lives, as apparently far away from each other as planets. I knew that ahead was a future in which one irrationally would want, indeed one already wanted, only one didn't quite know it, to leave a place where one was loved. I sensed that there was danger out there in the world, troughs of inexplicable sorrow in the lives of the adults around me, 
One day, my ordinarily calm mother weeping wildly in the kitchen and rushing from the room when I surprised her there. I also knew that the night sky was beautiful, that it was thrilling to sit on the roof, the leaves of the trees around me moving in a cool, oceanic darkness. I knew that when the laugh track from the television reached me on my rooftop, those distant gusts of hilarity made my vigil there both lonelier and somehow more important. We write often out of confusion and pain, out of the darkness of not knowing, and we believe that stories must tackle tragedy in order to be taken seriously. Murder and war, betrayals and lies, the ends of love affairs, death. This is not a wrong impulse. We understand that drama is created out of conflict, and a story in which the world is beautiful or thrilling or mysterious, in which the characters are kindly disposed toward each other, and for whom perhaps the cup of blessings sometimes overflows, seems like unpromising terrain for the writer. Yet still, I am often drawn, in my own fiction and in the work of other writers, to what seems to me the considerable and complicated drama of happiness. I'm interested in characters who want to be, though they will surely fail, courageous or kind or good, characters inclined toward the impulse for charity, characters who, for instance, might experience being a body in the world with something like spiritual rapture. This state, full of yearning, full of beauty, full of love, full of generosity and happiness, feels to me as powerful and moving and compelling as the human experience of misery or wrongdoing or terror in the biblical story of creation, dark and light, good and evil are in equal competition for the soul of the world, of course. Back when I was keeping my journal, I made a sad story out of my life because the happy story did not seem sufficiently interesting. But if I had known to look more carefully and clearly at the world around me, if I had written about what I saw and felt, about who and what I loved, about what made me happy, about what I found beautiful, and about what really troubled me, the truth that I didn't know anything, and that I was afraid of what I didn't know. I would have produced not only a far more truthful account of my days, but also, and for the fiction writer more importantly, a far more interesting one. We cannot neglect the light in our stories any more than we can neglect the dark. And without the light, of course, there would be no darkness at all. So the first rule in writing about happiness is not to be afraid of it. Go ahead, look right at it. And the second rule is that only on a sunny day are there shadows. Among the stories I liked best as a child were those by Beatrix Potter. Despite their superficial charm, like all of the enduring stories in children's literature, they skirt a dark shore. Death and disaster appear much more often than one would expect in fiction created for children. In the tale of Squirrel Nutkin, Old Brown is a menacing owl to whom a line of obedient squirrels like Roman prisoners bear platters of dead mice and fat moles and fish and nuts, offerings to a tyrant emperor as eccentric and unpredictable and dangerous as a psychopath. In the tale of Jemima Puddle Duck, ducks, rather dogs, ravage a duck's brood of helpless hatchlings. In Beatrix Potter's world of cunning interiors and cozy domesticity, behind its sunny, happy surfaces, there is also violence. The stories are delightful, and they are profoundly troubling, evoking forces that behave inexplicably, even brutally, in the face of the character's terrified politeness and innocence, their futile, pathetic efforts at domestic tranquility, their ambitions for happiness. There are good things and bad things present in the stories, and it is impossible to pry them apart. In the tale of Mrs. Tiggy Winkle, for instance, yes, I am going to unpack Mrs. Tiggy Winkle here. <laughs> a little girl named Lucy loses her handkerchief. In looking for it, she discovers a hedgehog washerwoman, washerwoman who lives under a hill in a nice clean kitchen with a flagged floor and wooden beams. The illustrations for the story evoke a place of surpassing coziness. Mrs. Tiggy Winkle in cap and apron and striped petticoat sitting on a bench before the fire with a cup of tea. At the end of the day, Lucy accompanies Mrs. Tiggy Winkle on her rounds as she delivers the washed and ironed clothes of the neighborhood creatures. But when Lucy climbs on the stile in the stone wall that separates her family's farm from the dramatic blue hills beyond and turns to say good night, Mrs. Tiggy Winkle, who had not waited either for thanks or for the washing bill, is running, running, running up the hill, small and brown, and covered with prickles. 
The washerwoman has gone, and in her place is nothing but a hedgehog. The story ends, as stories often do, with the end of something. In this case, the end of the day, the moment when children playing outside look up, alerted by the change in light, and know it is time to go home and soon to bed. Yet the story's ending, what has happened here? Has Lucy perhaps only imagined the whole thing? Was absolutely part of its attraction for me. Returning to the story as an adult, I see that there are suggestions of strangeness from the beginning. The way Lucy and Mrs. Tiggy Winkle sit on a bench in front of the fire, looking sideways at one another. Mrs. Tiggy Winkle's anxious look when Lucy first comes to the door, her frightened voice when she answers Lucy's knock. Has Lucy, as a human child, blundered across a boundary dividing the real from the magical? Might her appearance somehow threaten this magical place and its inhabitants? Just at the edge of the story's cozy, enchanted world is another, less familiar place where things are not what they seem, where the line between creatures and humans blurs, where night is falling and day is done, and where, in the end, we will be left alone to go to sleep, the most profoundly private state of human existence. <clears throat> I'm not arguing here, of course, for the literary sophistication of Mrs. Tiggywinkle, but I am suggesting that the story endures not only because it is charming, but also because it is strange, even disquieting. The presence of this other unpredictable, unknowable world, hedgehogs that turn into washerwomen, that turn into hedgehogs again, leaving our protagonist alone on the stile, makes the enchantment powerful, makes children want passionately to enter the story's sacred place again and again. I returned faithfully, passionately to these stories when I was a child, drawn to their complicated, difficult hearts. Now, as an adult, I understand better the combination of happiness and sadness they evoke. It is the same kind of melancholy that drifts over me sometimes when I stand at my kitchen sink at night washing dishes. In the black glass of the window over the sink, I see my own blurred reflection and the hazy familiar shapes behind me. Bright light over the stove, shaded lamp on the counter, flowers in a vase on the table. I am not unhappy. I am tired. But the day is almost done, soon the lights will be turned out and the house will be quiet. Yet often at these moments I find myself thinking of the people I know who have died, and I am vividly aware, as I look into the mirrored surface of the window, that for this moment I am alive. I am inside, in my warm kitchen, my children and my husband nearby, while those others, heartbreaking ghosts pacing the perimeter of the trees at the edge of the field, they are outside, forever outside. Contained in these moments, as there was for me as a child reading Beatrix Potter, is what I now think of as the achievement of fiction, the tension of two states, happiness and sadness, held together in a fixed, permanent Copernican relation, like planets in the sky. Lucy's magical afternoon is fleeting and illusory, more delicious for coming to an end for being eclipsed by the clumsy encroachment of ordinary life, the shadow of adulthood falling over the happiness of childhood. It is exactly, in fact, the encroachment of unhappiness, the presence of the end in the beginning, which makes the happiness of a story moving. The best story delivers happiness and sadness woven together so inextricably that they cannot be separated from each other. We often say that we ache with pleasure or desire, and it is in this exquisite conundrum that a writer must linger. Happiness in stories is built, I have concluded, by a summoning of its opposite, the wild, the mysterious, the unknown, the outlaw, the dangerous, the lost, the tragic, pressed up close, even if just for a moment, against the safe, the furnished, the well-lit, the cozy, the blissful. The contentment of the moment, the surprise of joy, is made compelling, like everything in literature, by specific description, of course. And a persuasive description of happiness will specifically suggest, almost inevitably, it seems, a threat to that happiness. The writer who tackles happiness, just like the writer who tackles unhappiness, or anything else, for that matter, needs a description of felt experience that is complex and particular. 
One way to accomplish this description is to select and layer images that create a dynamic and complex and even contradictory surface. An image has the power to attract in a concentrated form the things of the world. The critic and writer James Wood describes this phenomenon by the word thisness, which is a term actually coined by a medieval theologian um, in his wonderfully lucid book, How Fiction Works, that's Wood's book. By thisness, he writes, I mean any detail that draws abstraction to itself and seems to kill that abstraction with a puff of palpability any detail that centers our attention with its concretion. Images are, of course, among the most powerful tools a writer possesses. In his introductory to the poetry anthology, A Book of Luminous Things, Czesław Milos writes, since poetry deals with the singular, not the general, it cannot, if it is good poetry, look at things of this earth other than as colorful, variegated, and exciting. And so it cannot reduce life with all its pain, horror, suffering, and ecstasy to a unified tonality of boredom or complaint. By necessity, poetry is therefore on the side of being and against nothingness. If you want to describe happiness, therefore, side not with nothingness, but with being, make that happiness concrete with concrete images, <coughs> the things of this earth as Miloš says, and see to it that those images remind us of both life and death, of both the blue sky and the clouds whose shadows move across the landscape. Nearly any story can be profitably examined for how the writer arranges and orchestrates images, of course, and literature is full of passages of great happiness with their necessarily complicated tension of images. What follows are a few examples that seem to me particularly rich and moving and successful. And, and these are in the handout. In a review of Marilyn Robinson's toweringly beautiful novel, Home, the novelist A.O. Scott observes that Robinson attends with tact and precision to sensual details. In fact, Scott writes, most of what might be called the action in Home consists of the movements of a few characters, Glory, her father, and her brother, around their grand old house, from kitchen to living room, from garden to porch. They speak with sometimes strained politeness as they busy themselves with mundane domestic tasks. But those quotidian facts feel in Robinson's hand like vessels of the terrible, the sublime, and the miraculous. Here is a sample of that sublime happiness full of specificity and things of the world, and complete significantly with its touches of ruin and longing and decay, its subtle reminder of the eternal sleep that is death. Here's the passage. She made a dinner to welcome him home. The dining room table was set for three, lace tablecloth, good china, silver candlesticks. The table had in fact been set for days. When she put the vase of flowers in place, she noticed dust on the plates and glasses and wiped them with her apron, yellow tulips and white lilacs. It was a little past the season for both of them, but they would do. She had the grocery store deliver a beef roast, two pounds of new potatoes and a quart of ice cream. She made biscuits and brownies. She went out to the garden and picked young spinach, enough to fill the colander, pressed down and flowing over, as her father would say and Jack slept, and her father slept, and the day passed quietly with those sweet savors rising. Many of the moments in literature I find most moving are those that describe happiness, and the descriptions I like best inevitably contain the surprise of something strange and mysterious, what I like to call a disturbance of the story's equilibrium. In 1927, the bridge of St. Louis Ray won Thornton Wilder the first of his Pulitzer Prizes. In a spectacular passage, Wilder records the happiness of Brother Juniper, a little red-haired Franciscan from northern Italy, in the fragile instant before he witnesses a tiny footbridge in Peru snap, killing the five travelers suspended on its span across a gulf. It was a very hot noon, that fatal noon, and coming around the shoulder of a hill, Brother Juniper stopped to wipe his forehead and to gaze upon the screen of snowy peaks in the distance, then into the gorge below him, filled with the dark plumage of green trees and green birds and traversed by its ladder of osier. 
Joy was in him. Things were not going badly. He had opened several little abandoned churches and the Indians were crawling into early mass and groaning at the moment of miracle as though their hearts would break. Perhaps it was the pure air from the snows before him. Perhaps it was the memory that brushed him for a moment of the poem that bade him raise his eyes to the helpful hills. At all events, he felt at peace. And then his gaze fell upon the bridge. And a moment later, he hears a twanging noise and he sees the bridge divide and fling five gesticulating ants into the valley below. Everything in this description of joy, joy was in him contains the mystery and miracle of the world, both its liveliness and its morbidity. Here is nature made animate by the phrase, the plumage of green trees. Here is the intimation of the next life or the transparency of this one in the screen of snowy peaks, like a veil drawn between this world and the hereafter. Marilyn Robinson's novel, Gilead, I know I'm quoting her again, but she's very, very good at this. Um, won the Pulitzer Prize in 2004. The narrator of the novel, a preacher named John Ames, recounts the story of making a long journey on foot with his father to visit the grave of his grandfather. It is a hard journey, a journey of penance. It takes them a long time to travel from their home in Iowa to the dilapidated graveyard in Kansas and then to clean up the neglected plots as best they can. When their work is done, the boy John and his father Quote, stood there together with our miserable clothes all damp and our hands all dirty from the work and the first crickets rasping and the flies really beginning to bother and birds crying out the way they do when they're about ready to settle for the night. And then John's father begins to pray and the moment that follows is a moment of absolutely profound joy. Every prayer seemed long to me at that age and I was truly bone tired. I tried to keep my eyes closed, but after a while, I had to look around a little. And this is something I remember very well. At first, I thought I saw the sun setting in the east. I knew where the east was, because the sun was just over the horizon when we got there that morning. And then I realized that what I saw was a full moon rising just as the sun was going down. Each of them was standing on its edge with the most wonderful light between them. It seemed as if you could touch it, as if there were palpable currents of light passing back and forth, or as if there were great taut skeins of light suspended between them. I wanted my father to see it, but I knew I'd have to startle him out of his prayer, and I wanted to do it in the best way, so I took his hand and kissed it. Pages later, Robinson takes up this moment again. I can't tell you, though, John says, how I felt walking along beside him that night, along that rutted road, through that empty world. What a sweet strength I felt in him and in myself and all around us. I have rarely felt joy like that, an assurance. It was like one of those dreams where you're filled with some extravagant feeling you might never have in life. It doesn't matter what it is, even guilt or dread. And you learn from it what an amazing instrument you are so to speak, what a power you have to experience beyond anything you might ever actually need. Who would have thought that the moon could dazzle and flame like that? The happiness in this passage, the enormous sympathy and sweetness and majesty of it, is deepened by the strangeness of the moment, the occult phenomenon of the moon and the sun present together in the sky, the melancholy nature of the boy and his father's mission to the graveyard, the silence around them, the hard fact of death, the miraculous, irrational buoyancy of religious faith. And here's the sort of final passage. One of what I think of as the most extraordinary descriptions of happiness in literature comes at the very end of Shirley Hazard's World War II novel, The Great Fire, which is an absolutely beautiful, brilliant novel. A pair of lovers reunites at last after a long and painful separation, during which it is not clear whether they will ever see one another again. In a stroke of brilliance, Hazard moves with transcendent and terrible speed beyond the joy of their togetherness to invoke their eventual and inevitable parting. Here's the passage. 
For this, he had traveled to the airy, empty harbor, where, like a legend, she lay in the mildewed swing seat, waiting. As surely as if she had leapt from a planked deck into the ocean and swum ashore, she has jumped ship for him. 10,000 miles had been retraced, down to the final fleshly inch where he could wake and touch her and say her name. Many had died, but not she, not he, not yet. Take away that last line, of course, many had died, but not she, not he, not yet, and the end of the novel, he could wake and touch her and say her name, becomes sentimental. But with that final line, and especially with those two final words, not yet, Hazard has reminded us that death is waiting for this pair with whom we have come to sympathize so profoundly. And by reminding us of this, she has made this scene of happiness exquisite. In the moment of this couple's perfect joy, having brought them together at last, she has reminded us of the fragility of their happiness, the unbearable and inescapable truth that it will not last forever, that the sweetness of their moment in one another's arms, the sweetness of life itself, will in the end feel too cruelly short. I cannot go back now and keep the journal my teacher wanted me to keep long ago. But I know now what I did not know then, and perhaps what he wanted me to discover. As writers, we fear happiness. We fear the traps, big traps, of sentimentality and cliche, of overwriting and oversimplification, even of tedium, the, the flat line of of happiness. But we need not fear it, I think. A good and true story is made up of both happiness and sadness, and good and true writing will pair the two states again and again, bring them so close together that they make a kind of exquisite tension. I'm going to end with a poem, actually a part of a poem, by Edward Hirsch called Happiness Writes White. Uh, here are just a few lines from that. I think the poem, I think I included it in the pattern. I don't believe that only sorrow and misery can be written, the poem goes. Happiness, too, can be precise. <coughs> Doctor, there's a keen throbbing on the left side of my chest where my ribs are wrenched by joy. Wings flutter in my shoulders and blood courses through my body like waves cresting on a choppy sea. Look. The eyes blur with tears, and the tears clear. My head is like skylight. My heart is like dawn. Thank you. I know that many people are trying to get out of here. I mean, are some of you, I think, meeting with your last workshop groups this morning? Um, so I, I'm happy to take questions, but I also think it would be fine if you got up and hustled off to your last um, engagement here. So anyway, thank you again, Matt and Peter and Jennifer. And thank you to everybody who uh, really showed me so much all week long again and again. It was great. Anybody have a question? Yeah. This is a question so much as uh, an opportunity to Plump for my uh, my and this is in YA literature, but my um, absolute favorite you know happy uh, moment in the book is the end of Ramona and her father. <laughs> I don't know who here has read the Ramona book. Oh yeah. But an outrageously moving happy ending to that book. It's 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 miraculous. So if people who haven't read the Ramona books, go out and read them. And then I also think of Little House in the Prairie, the end of all of them with uh, the father playing the violin, the, 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 the roof over the heads. Um, there's something it's interesting that I think mainly is YA. Of course you're talking about you know with but I uh, and of course now I guess I don't know if YA has moved more toward more more monolithically toward is dramatic and traumatic. But some of the older YA, you know, has these, among the really good writers, these just brilliant evocations of happiness. Yeah. And I think in adult literature, it's, it's uh, writers have found it a little harder to find that place. Yeah. Well, it feels like such dangerous 
territory to walk into. Yeah. But so, it's not really a question. Where would we be a, without them? Those <laughs> those great moments. Yeah. I think there also might be a complication now with dealing with happiness that comes from the idea that so many writers are involved in meditation and in you know, an inner view that happiness, not, not to say this in a trite way, that happiness is partly a choice. And so I think there's a little bit of confusion about looking at, um, at um, you know, the complexity of the term. And I'm, not, well, I'm also unsure about what it means anymore. Um, yeah. Well, I think it's, it's absolutely that <clears throat> complexity the, the complicated quality of it that is so difficult to approach for a writer, and yet when you can do it, it's, you know. I have a friend who says he only has two requirements for a story, and one is that it keep him interested, and the other is that it break his heart. That's what he wants. <laughs> and somehow it's those moments of, of great joy, complicated, happiness, whatever that happiness is, and happiness for one person is not the same happiness for a different person. You know, for a stamp collector, it's finding a rare stamp. But those are those absolutely necessary moments. Yeah, Peter? Carol, you know what? A wonderful meditation on this dimension of human experience, and I'm thinking of, I don't know if you studied or knew Hyatt Wagner back in our brown days. Mm -hmm. So in Hyatt's last book, which is called American Visionary Poetry, he maps out a kind of trope that he calls the via affirmativa, playing it off the via negativa, both yeah. in tropes of versions of spiritual experience. But the affirmativa is certainly uh, engaged with enumeration and affirmation and immersion in a kind of thingness that you know has re redeeming nature to it, and I think of that only just offering it in, in, in conjunction to what you've really beautifully explored here. And Hyatt's book might, you know interest you. Uh, it would indeed. Thank you. I'm glad to know about it. I, I will go. This, this is a part, only part of a much longer essay, a big messy essay, but I, I, that would be very yeah. helpful. So I'm, I'm glad to know about that. I thought your talk was <clears throat> just so beautiful. I thought it felt like a reading at times. Mm -hmm. um, and what I think what was going on maybe, and I think Peter was maybe speaking to this, is that the, the way you spoke, you yourself, maybe you were talking about your journal and how it was so boring and chronically today, but then you took it to the My level. family still teases me. <laughs> but then you took it to the level of walking to school and what you saw, and so your illustrations of what you wrote, and every much of what you said was illustrating exactly the specificity. And it also reminded me of Brian Hall's endings, where you you're, you're have the pomposity of an ending <coughs> So there's too much, you know, the, the danger of too muchness. And the same with happiness, the danger of too muchness. Yeah. And so a little bit of the same idea of the undercutting, the, the, the light and the dark, having to really be conscious of the vibrating kind of incongruity. Yeah, that's a perfect word for vibrating, that they have to be vibrating against each other. It's a great word. I think you've answered my question already, but uh, I'm wondering if what you uh, did for us today, which I agree was wonderful, if that uh, it has been published or people can gain access to that, or is it going to just be part of this larger work that's been Well, I, 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 I have to, uh, no, it's not been published, and it, it is part of this much bigger, messier thing where I actually do quite a lot of looking at children's literature. For, I'm interested in children's literature. I have three kids, and so I've been reading aloud to my kids and looking at the books that they've been reading for 25 years. My, my oldest child is 25 now. Um, and so I just have this big sloppy thing and I don't really know what it will become or what one can or should do with it. And I feel, I, I was so blown away by, by the craft talks that people have delivered this week. I just like, it just boggled my mind 
watching writers talk about literature in ways that, you know, I guess, I mean, I teach at a little college, so theoretically, I'm doing that in my classes, but to see people be so eloquent about their own, or so smart about their own intentionality, or even what they have created at the end, um, just kind of blew me away. I, I, I feel very hesitant about giving advice in a, in a craft talk, and so instead I did this kind of blundering around trying to ask myself questions about these things that, that occupy me as a, as a reader, mostly. Um, so I don't have any, I mean, I don't have any more of it. I don't know what I'm going to ever do with it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I would suggest somehow you find a way to make a uh, self-contained essay of what we gave us today because I think it would be a great use not only the writers but the teachers of writing. You could somehow make a short essay uh, in, in praise of happiness uh, the way you did, uh, grounding it in this complexity, and, and extract that from this larger project. Uh, that would make a, a useful essay. I like to have it anyway. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just always trying to get my students these stories come in, you know, one after the other. <laughs> I just, <laughs> it was so sad. And I'm always trying to get them to like pull back from, from that sad. I think it was, it was Raymond Carver maybe who said there are moments in everybody's day that are good literature and that's what you ought to write about. Was it Raymond Carver who said that? I think, I think maybe it was. I'm always just trying to get them to like just do the, the moment. Just do the moment in your day. Don't run them over by trains and have them bitten by vampires. <laughs> Don't do that. They want to. They really want to. They want to kill them. You know. <laughs> they just have this. I mean, in a way that maybe only 18-year-olds can want to do, because they all feel they're invincible anyway. So it's perfectly okay to them to <laughs> step on their necks. Okay. David's been saying all oh, week, yes, step on their necks. <laughs> it seems perfectly okay to them to do that. And it's, it's just like a constant, I'm just constantly trying to pull them back from that, from that edge, that scary edge. Anyway, thank you all very much.